51, and you know, <laughs> when I was doing this psalm, as we do the first 50, you know, going through and studying and trying to keep it to one session, uh, this one was a little tough because of me, because before I, I figured, well, listen, I'm going to do Psalm 51 talking about when you commit a grievous sin, you know, the process to repent and confess and get forgiveness from God. I wanted to see why. This was a big thing in, with David in his life that changed his life because of his sin and affected so many other people. So, so what we did was we read 2 Samuel chapter 11 and 12 first, and that took a good portion of what I was going to do with Psalm 51. So when I came, I looked at the clock, and I'm like, oh boy. So I did point one, and I had hoped to do point two last week. Didn't get it done. And, you know, it's okay. I mean, I'm not in a rush, but I, I, would, I would want to... I had hoped to get the first two points in, but listen, I'd rather us understand and, and see what happened and how, you know, the nature of the sin, very serious, it was not just adultery, it was adultery and then murder, and you know how it affected David's life. Psalm 51, very, very important for people that have done wrong and how to get right with God, um, and of course we're going to look more so. Let's read it again. I'll read Psalm 51, uh, verses 1 through 19. There's 19 verses here. Now, some psalms in the past, there were 8, 9, 10 verses, whatever. Well, you can, you know, do that in a session. But uh, this is 19, and because of the background I went into in 2 Samuel, we, we're not going to finish it. So let's do that. We'll read it. We'll pick up uh, and point two, believe it or not. And uh, we may not finish it tonight, all right? We may have to do this next year. Uh, I mean, <laughs> first Sunday of the new year. Psalm 51 says to the chief musician, Psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet came unto him after he had gone into Bathsheba. And then verse 1, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me against thee, Thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity and in sin that my mother conceived me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Verse 7, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of, my, of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then he says in verse 13, Will I teach transgressors thy ways and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else I would give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. O God, thou wilt not despise. Do good in thy good pleasure unto Zion. Build thou the walls of Jerusalem. Thou shalt, then thou shalt be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offering and whole burnt offerings. Then shall they offer bullocks upon thine altar. Well, very uh, important things here and uh, process that people need to go through. And David went through. He suffered, or I should say he tormented himself by not going to God for a year, confessing you know, his sin. And of course, the man of God there, Nathan, the prophet, came to him, gave him that story, remember, of the man that was rich that took the, he had many, many herd of sheep and all kinds of things, very rich man. And if a guest came and he went to the poor man that had one little baby lamb, remember? And David said, that man must die and restore him all things. And what did Nathan say? You're the man. And David knew he, uh, God knew, and God knew before that Nathan came, but it sort of was like a smack in the face of David to turn to God and a heartfelt confession. Not maybe so uh, sorry he got caught, but truly sorry, repentant, 
And uh, again, because of the things he said and did in the psalm that proved he was sincere. First of all, we won't repeat every little thing here. First point, which I did last week, was cry out for God's mercy and compassion. That, that was verses 1 through 3. Have mercy upon me. We looked at loving kindness, what it meant. God's tender mercies, his unfailing love. And so David did that in the first three verses. And then we want to look at point two, which is, again, I had hoped to do last week. Confess your sin. <laughs> and I don't want to rush through this because, you know, a lot of people, like I said, don't maybe understand what that means. You've dealt with your kids. If you have kids and you raise them and you, you know, we, uh, when we got saved, uh, my son was 1982, right? Two years old. <laughs> Tina wasn't born yet. She wasn't born until 1984. And so um, we went through a process of, of, of growing as a new babe in Christ, my wife and I. And Margaret was like Terry, a teacher. I must have a thing for school teachers. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, Margaret was an early childhood major in college, and she taught second grade. And so when we had kids, uh, I, she said, look, I want to be a mom. I don't want to be working and have somebody else raise my kids. I said, same here. Uh, I was doing very well as a chiropractor. She didn't have to work. So um, she raised the kids and was home with them. And we learned about discipline in church when we got saved. It was an independent Baptist church in Stewart, Florida. And when the pastor started talking about discipline, we had an evangelist come, I think, that first year. You remember when you used to have one or two week revival meetings every night? You don't hear about them anymore, right? We wonder why we don't have revival. Anyway, the, uh, this pastor, I think it was Bill Rice uh, from the Bill Rice Ranch. Not the original, but Bill Rice, it's the second or a junior, whatever it was, but very good preacher. Wednesday night was family night, so he preached all week, but Wednesday was specifically about family. And he talked about uh, child discipline. Now, my wife went to Jersey City State College, same school I went to, public college. They taught you about not spanking, don't touch your kids, you don't want to hurt this and that, and they break their will, and, uh, you know, child abuse, and this and that, and corporal punishment. And so that's how we're taught, Dr. Spock, you know. And so uh, she's like, well, I don't know about that. I don't know if this is right. I don't know necessarily agree with this preacher here. Bop, bop, beep, bop, bop. And so we said, we're going to, let's see what the Bible has to say. And this guy gave us many, many scriptures in the Bible. And then we went to the pastor. And uh, my wife says, you know, my son Dominic, he's really a good kid. I mean, he listens to everyone. You know, he's not really a bad kid. What are you trying to say? He's perfect. He's a sinner. Well, I don't know. I, you know, I, I know I've been with kids, you know, as a teacher. And I know some kids just... There's such bad, you know, uh, problems with discipline. Uh, they have a, a very strong-willed child, you know, the whole deal. James Dobson, we read all these books and everything. So the pastor says, I suggest you give your son a little test. And uh, she, she said, well, he's, what does he like to do? He likes Legos. I think he still does, and he's 40 years old. Anyway, he likes Legos. <laughs> and we'd get him these things, and he'd sit there quietly and work on them. She says, tell him when he's doing Legos, he's got to stop and do something else. You know, see if he obeys you. Oh, he, he's a good kid. He'll obey me. So uh, he's doing it. And she goes, Don, I want to stop right now. What are you doing? I'm going to color over here. And I'll leave that spot, go to the table, get the stuff out there, crayons, whatever. And uh, he goes, he's not saying anything. He's still working on his Legos, you know. She goes, Don, did you hear me? I said, I want you to stop what you're doing. And he goes, no, I don't want to stop. You know, I'm, I'm building the thing here. And I, I know you like to do that, but I'm telling you, your mommy says, stop that. I want you to go over there and do the coloring. Well, he didn't do it. And he, she's like, Don, if you don't do it, you're going to get a spanking, you know. <laughs> He's thinking, like, what, what am I doing wrong, you know? Like he was set up anyway. He didn't listen. And she went back and told the pastor, you were right. He, 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 he's a little sinner, you know. I thought, what do you think he was, G Jesus, the second coming of Christ? Of course he's a, he's a sinner. But, you know, new Christians, we don't know anything about the Bible. We're never taught I would say never. We were taught, you know, the doctrine they want us to know is the Catholic Church's doctrine, but they never talked about family things and uh, child discipline, although the priests and nuns used to smack us all over the Catholic school. But um, anyway, we, we, we learned things, you know, that there's a way to take care of, of problems in the church. Now, there's discipline, there's church discipline, but there's personal accountability to, to God and to the church. But most of all, what David says in uh, verse 4 of chapter 51 here, of Psalm 51, is true. He says, against thee and thee only 
have I sinned? The first thing when we do when we sin is to sin against God. And that's how we have to realize. We always think, oh, I'm sorry, I hurt you, I hurt your feelings, and we ask for forgiveness, you know, this way here. But really, if we look at it and see for what it is and how terrible it is, and if, if we were the only person on this earth that Jesus came to die for our sin, he went to the cross for us because of our sin. And so uh, understanding proper confession and repentance will, will, will helps a lot in an individual's life, family lives, our children's lives, and when they become adults in the church. I think if people understood this more, we might have less problems when we have to deal with adults, right? So confess your sin. After hiding his sin, again, nearly a year, David comes clean. The Hebrew word here, confess, again, it's not mentioned here, but to confess means you acknowledge. You, you declare your sin to God, all right? Um, the first step in a lot of these 12-step programs is to realize you have a problem, right? A lot of the 12-step programs originated in, in biblical principles. Understand that you have a sin problem. A lot of people have a hard time doing that. Uh, when I try to lead people to Christ a lot of times, very religious people think, I'm not, say it was with me. When the, when the woman said to me, if you died right now, you go to heaven, I said, yeah. And she goes, why? Uh, Catholic, you know, and you start thinking of maybe what good things you did in your life. You don't want to think of yourselves as a sinner. It's pride. It's human nature. And so it's tough for people to admit, uh, you know, the way of the master, right? When he goes and says, let me ask you a few questions. You know, are you a good person? Yeah, well, let me ask you a few. And he uses the law. Have you ever told a lie? You know, a lot of people say, well, everybody tells a lie. You know, it's a little white lie. It's not that bad. No, it's bad. <laughs> Uh, have you ever looked at a woman and lusted after her? Well, I think we all do that. You know, he says, well, you're an adulterer at heart. Jesus said you committed adultery in your heart if you'd started in your mind, because that's where sin starts. So we realize that we have to see the, the ugliness, I think, and the blackness, the darkness of sin, uh, that it's not a casual thing, and that it offends a holy God, that we're so, f we're so far removed from what, how God really is. That's why Isaiah chapter 6 when you see God how he is, remember Isaiah saw himself, woe is me, he said. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live in the midst of a people of unclean lips. I'm, an, I'm undone. And so we have to see ourselves that way. And so David, again, confesses. The Greek word in the New Testament for confess literally means to agree with God. You have to agree with God about what? About your sin. See it as God sees it, not as we think. Well, it's not that bad. The problem with sin is the more you sin, the more likely you are to repeat it and get worse. It bec you become calloused. Uh, you know, your conscience is seared, right, like, like a hot iron. Things that maybe would bother you one time, maybe it doesn't bother you as much. You don't blush as much over certain things that we should. And so confessing sins, we, we agree with God that it's a terrible thing, all right? And there's a few points here. Number one, in confessing your sin. Confess that your sin is against God. We'll deal with, with everyone else this way, but first we've got to go to him. It's against God and God alone. Look at verse 4 again, the first part. Against thee and thee only. Wait a minute. He, he sinned with Bathsheba, which is really against her and her husband, right? And he had him murdered. <laughs> But he says, against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil. Sin is evil. A lot of times we grade sin. You know, this is, this is not too bad. This is a little worse. Like, you know, this is really bad over here. No, it's bad. It's all bad. David begins his confession here by recognizing, first and foremost, all sin is a sin against God. And, and David was not denying he, that he'd sinned against others, he did, but first and foremost, it's against God, because he did sin against Uriah, Bathsheba, his own family, the nation. You know, when a pastor who's the under-shepherd of a church, right, or any elder in a church commits sin, of course it affects him and his family, but it affects the whole church. When the leader from the top down, he used to say, well, does that mean if somebody else sins, it's not that bad? No, it's bad for everyone, but it's especially bad when the leaders in the church and the elders in the Old Testament, remember the priests were committing terrible sins, the Old Testament priests, and God judged them. David was acknowledging, number one, he sinned against God in a greater way, 
because it's a holy, sinless God, then he sinned against anybody else. He broke in God's laws. It was an enormous offense, and of course, he had guilt, which you should have. Again, not that you got caught. <laughs> Oops. Oh, I, I, no, everybody knows. Joseph understood. I'm sorry. Joseph in the Old Testament. Remember Joseph. <laughs> How God worked all the bad things that happened to him. If you look at his life, wow, I can't believe one thing after the other. His brother sold him into slavery. He goes into Potiphar. The wife goes after him. She's the one that should have gotten in trouble. But he got in trouble because she lied about him. In the prison all through his life. But in the end... <laughs> In Genesis chapter 50, we see what he said to his brothers, remember, in Egypt now. You meant it for harm. God meant it for good. And so David here broke God's law. He must go to, first of all, every sin is a sin against God. Second, confess that you deserve God's judgment. A lot of times we think, well, there's consequences in this life. You reap what you sow. Even lost people uh, reap what they sow when it comes to sinning against their bodies, against their flesh. You smoke cigarettes, you get, you get lung cancer. But we're talking about not just physical consequences, but spiritual, affecting your family and others. So confess, and that's a hard thing. I deserve what I got coming to me. <laughs> we do. Hey, we, de we deserve hell. All right, that's God. It's only by God's mercy that we don't get what we do deserve, and by His grace, He gives us a free gift of salvation. Look at verse 4 again, Psalm 51. Against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. See, God sees it all. That thou might be justified, he's saying to God, when you speak and you're clear when you judge. When you, when you judge me, I'm, say, I'm saying I'm sinning against you and you alone so you can be clear when you speak and when you judge me. And he realized, he knew it, that he'd done very, very wrong, very, very evil. David was ready to accept whatever judgment God imposed upon him. You know, and even God, after he had forgiven David, you still got to face the judgment. You're still going to reap what you've sown. Adultery and murder here in his case, serious offenses among probably other things, lying and all the other things. Under God's law, you know, for Israel, the law, both of these things David did were punishable by death, the death penalty. David acknowledged he deserved God's judgment. He confessed that God would be justified, or it would be correct, proper, and right, whatever the sentence, whatever the punishment was. And he's right about that. So that's the second point. Confess and acknowledge you deserve God's judgment, whatever it is. Third, confess that you are a dirty, rotten, vile sinner by nature. This is like the pig going to the mud. We're, we're depraved. We're, why? Because we fall way short of God's glory, sinless perfection. Where's that? Look at verse 5 here, Psalm 51, 5. Behold, I was shapen. I'm a sinner. That's how I was made. I'm a sinner. I was shapen in iniquity. And in sin did my mother conceive me. Now that verse has been misinterpreted. David understood his sin was the fruit of what he was. I'm a sinner, so sinners sin. And we fall short of God's glory, Romans 3.23, right? We all fall short. Once again, David's making no excuses here. His sinful nature was present from the time his mother conceived him. The sexual act is not a gross, vile sin. God made us that way to reproduce. So he's not saying that here. He's saying, from the time I was conceived, I'm a sinner. From the womb. We say, oh, the little innocent little baby. Oh, the little innocent baby is a sinner because of Adam's original sin. That's why we sin. We are. We commit sins because that's what we are. We're sinners. Remember, he says, in sin did my mother conceive me. Again, not the result that David's uh, parents uh, committed a sexually immoral act. They didn't. They were married. They had a license. It testifies to our sinful nature. When he was conceived, the moment the male sperm and the female egg met, two cells made one live cell. That's conception. That's a young life. Uh, abortion is from conception when you murder and when someone takes a, a medical procedure or a drug and kills that cells of a human life I believe that's the beginning of a human soul at conception we'll say well the baby is not able to take care of itself what's the word viability it's not viable outside the womb what does that have to do with anything 
Today, it's a crime if a woman is in an accident and dies and the baby inside of her dies. That's like double manslaughter. Why is it double manslaughter if it's not manslaughter when a doctor does it? Well, it is in God's sight. And so when he was conceived, he inherited, like we all do, the sinful nature of Adam. That's what I talked about this morning. Jesus wasn't born the way we all were. It was a virgin birth. Therefore, he was not conceived in sin, but everyone else is. Fourth, two more points here. He confessed that God desires, what does God desire? David says, truth and wisdom. In other words, making correct decisions from the depths of our heart. Look at verse 6 here, Psalm 51, 6. Behold, he's again crying out to God. Thou desirest truth in the inward parts, all right, in your soul. And in the hidden part, the hidden man, thou shalt make me to know what? Wisdom. We all need that, amen? David understood, understood God does not merely want us to conform outwardly to his commands. This is what happens with kids a lot of times. Well, they'll be obedient because we're strict with them, but are they really doing it because they know this is right to do or are they doing it just because we told them? <laughs> Ever think about that? Outwardly obedient, inwardly rebellious. Sometimes you can tell by their posture, by maybe the, the face they make. <sighs> okay, I'll clean my room. Can you imagine? Did you ever have that happen? I had something. <laughs> I was coaching. It was my son that my wife thought was Jesus. Anyway, he, he said something to me disrespectfully in a practice one day. And, and I, I didn't react properly. I know that. I took him by the throat with one hand. <laughs> he stood up and I, what did you say? <laughs> and I said it so loud. The guys that were like five football fields away said, was that you during practice today? I heard this loud screaming like cry and I said yeah it was me unfortunately I was taking care of my son something that he did but he was very sorry after that <laughs> I think he was afraid I was going to kill him are we truly sorry or, or is it an outward no he says I want truth in the inward part <laughs> the hidden make me to know wisdom truly on the inside so it's going to show on the outside. We, we can fake it. Let's face it. We've done that before, right? All of us, I'm sure. God desires his truth abides within us. When God's truth, which comes through his word and by his Holy Spirit, fills us, it empowers us to make right decisions to be wise. How? Through his word, by being doers of the word. Amen? We say that all the time. And so David opened himself up to God's word in his sin-stained heart, his heart that was by birth sinful, inviting the Lord to teach him to make wise decisions. He, he longed, and we should long, to know God's wisdom in an intimate way in the innermost part of our beings, and that will affect what we do on the outside. But on the outside, without that inward uh, Holy Spirit and the inward power of God's Word and truth and that wisdom, uh, we can, again, it's gonna, all it is is faking. Uh, we, we must want and desire truth in the inward parts, as he said in verse 6. Fifth and last point here on point 2. <laughs> Confess that God alone can cleanse you and wash away your sins. He confessed. It was really deep in his heart. He, he meant all this. And now he's waiting on God to clean him up. Look at verse 7. Purge me. You know what a purging is? like a pruning process, right, that we do with plants to make them bear more fruit. We clean up all the bad things and the rotten leaves and the dead stuff. So that's what God has to do with us sometimes. And he's asking God to purge him. Purge me with hyssop. All right, hyssop is in reference to the cleansing in the Old Testament in Leviticus chapter 14. They used this with leprosy, with lepers. David desired more than just mere forgiveness. He wanted to be clean from the inside out so he wouldn't continually sin. A sin like a leprosy of sin. Only God would cleanse him and purge him so that he would not even have the desire to do what he did before. Purge me with hyssop. And then he says, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be what? Whiter than snow. You know, the New Testament says that the inner cleansing it happens if we allow, and we can fight this, but we allow God's word right, to work on us, on the inward man. That's John 17, 17. John 17, 17 says, sanctify them. That word sanctify, set apart. 
holy, right? Sanctify them through thy truth, Jesus said. Thy word is truth. So the word of God uh, is one of the ways we're cleaned and we're cleansed. Amen? As we receive God's word, we study it, we read it, we meditate on it, we ruminate like the cow with the different stomachs, right? And keep bringing it up and over and over again until we get all we can out of it, memorize it, meditate on it, but most important, you can do all those things, then obey it. <laughs> I tell you about the guy that memorized the Bible, but he didn't obey parts of the Bible. He obeyed the parts he wanted to, but he didn't obey all of it. We must be obedient students of the Word of God, submit to it, and it will cleanse our inner filthiness. Again, that's being a human. We'll do what God's Word commands rather than give in to the desires of our flesh. Amen? And that's what we should all want. All right, we're going to be able to maybe get a little bit of point three in here tonight. So he said, cry out, point one. We did that last week. For mercy and compassion and God's tender mercies. That was verses one through three. Tonight we said, and most important, I think, confess. Come clean. Confess your sin. That's verses four through seven. Point three, pray for restoration. All right? It's a, it's a process. Restoration. So, Cry out to God, please be merciful, right? Second, this is the sin. I've done it. It's against you and you only. And then third now, pray for restoration and renewal. Look at verse 8 through 12 again. I know we read it already, but let's look at verse 8 through 12. Make me to hear joy and gladness. Again, you know the words, that the bones which thou hast broken because of his sin. Not God didn't break his bones on purpose, but because of his sin. That the bones which you've broken may rejoice. I hide thy face from my sins and blot out all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renewal, you hear it? Renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. You know, sin uh, has consequences. You say, well, I know that. The worse the sin, the higher the cost to you and others. David committed murder. Adultery, maybe two of the worst, right? Much of what was lost, the child, remember, that the, that Sheba was pregnant with, dead. Nothing you can do to change that. He would suffer the consequences, we know, David did, the rest of his life. He himself could be restored, and he prayed for God to grant restoration and renewal. But he reaped things that would, would always never be the same again. First, and a few points, just two points here, or point three, and we'll be done tonight. Ask God to restore your joy. Remember the joy when you first got saved? You know what sin does to that man? It's, it robs you of your joy. And you can make the smile on the outside, but we know when you've done wrong against God, there's no, no true joy deep in your heart, and you have to Imagine going around faking. He says, man, I want, I want my joy restored. I don't want to go around miserable. Look at verse 8 and 9 here. Make me to hear joy and gladness, like in other words, again, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice again. Hide thy face from my sins. Blot out all mine iniquities as if they never happened. And God can do that, of course, and only God. For a year, David carried around the burden, trying to make believe it didn't happen, maybe try to forget it and... and Concentrate on other things. You know, he tried all he can humanly, but that, that never works. You need forgiveness. You need restoration. He was crushed, David was, physically, spiritually, and emotionally beneath the weight of sin. Sin is a heavy, heavy burden. That's why Jesus went to the cross. When he opened the door for sin to enter his life, the day he sinned with Bathsheba, his joy and gladness vanished. Day and night, he was tortured by guilt in his conscience, and God's hand of discipline crushed him all the way to his bones. The bones, he said, that thou hast broken, in verse 8. David begged God here in verse 8 and 9 to restore joy to his heart and relieve the pain and the agony of his broken heart. But even more tormenting, listen, than David's guilty conscience and guilt, feelings of guilt, and God's discipline, what was more, what was worse than that? The loss of communion with the Lord. That, that relationship back and forth with the Lord is broken. Now, you're, again, your fellowship and communion is broken, but your sonship 
as a child of God is never broken, right? You can never unbecome a child of God once you become a child of God. But the fellowship, not the same. His sin robbed him of the joy and the gladness that sprung up from living in fellowship with God. It wasn't there anymore. What happened? Sin. Not only was David's sin and hideous sin always before him, he said, my sin is ever before me, but it was ever present before the face of God as well, making an impassable wall again, that fellowship again between him and God. Again, not his salvation, but the moment by moment daily fellowship and thirsting for that renewed fellowship David humbly asked the Lord to blot out all his sin wipe it away so that God would no longer look or see it it would be gone and he hadn't done that he tried to do it on his own he hadn't come clean before God and confessed and asked his joy until Psalm 51 by doing this the Lord's condemnation would cease the joy of his relationship with God would be restored and we all need that. Second, and my last point tonight, ask God to transform his heart and spirit, to renew. That's verses 10 to 12. Look at it again. Create in me a clean heart. Look at these words, create. Renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. These words, create, renew, restore, Uphold. David, again, his depraved heart, because he's a sinful human, just like we all are, except we're forgiven sinful humans. His depraved heart caused him to do irreparable and irre irreversible damage to himself and others. And never again did he want to do that. He sinned, yes. And, and he could be forgiven, but the effects of his sin, especially with Uriah, the Hittite, he's not coming back to life. He had him murdered. But never again did he want to do that. Never again did he want to experience God's crushing discipline. And therefore he asked God to transform him by what? Creating a clean heart. He was saved that it's almost like you get a new heart of salvation. You get a, a transformed. You're born again. But David didn't have to be born again, but he wanted to have restored unto him what he had lost. Again, not salvation, but the joy and the relationship and the one-on-one -on -one uh, intimacy that he had at one time with God. He asked God to renew a right spirit, it says, within him. Right comes from the verb, which means to make firm, fixed, steadfast, right? Until this sin, David, again, stood firm at one time in the face of temptation. Now he asked God once again to stir him to be steadfast and restore that right, firm, steadfast spirit within him that he once had before this terrible sin. David asked God not to reject him, not to remove his presence, his Holy Spirit from him there in verse 11. Some interpret that to mean David feared of God permanently ending his relationship. Some commentators, this is the further, furthest thing from the truth, all right? He didn't lose his salvation. He asked again, David did not fear losing his salvation. He asked God to restore the joy in verse 12 of his salvation. Nothing can be, bring greater joy to a life of a person than knowing your sins are forgiven. And we have a home in heaven, all right? Eternal, the Bible says, John 3, everlasting and eternal life. David's unconfessed sin prior to this choked the joy out of his heart for nearly a year. In order to be upheld and sustained when facing future temptations, David asked God for an additional gift. Second half of verse 12, what is it? A free or willing spirit. Now maybe, again, commentators believe David was referring to the Holy Spirit, but it's more likely he was repeating his request in verse 10 for a steadfast, firm spirit. He desired to have a spirit of integrity that would do the right thing and obey God and be victorious. We talk about live the victorious Christian life that you don't have to give in to sin. When Jesus purchased our redemption on the cross, he brought back everything that sin cost us. It doesn't mean you'll not suffer the consequences of sin, all right? You reap what you sow. We, should, we cannot undo sometimes the damage that sin brings to us and others. That's what we should think about before we sin, the consequences. Of course, we don't always do that, but we can be restored, amen? 
God can heal us from the wounds of sin. He, he stands ready to give back what we've forfeited when we give in to temptation. Many believers who commit terrible sins feel they have no hope. Things will never be the same as they once were, but here's the thing. God's grace is greater than our sin. Amen? We can be restored to God. We can be forgiven and cleansed. We, God can bring peace to a guilty conscience. We can know the joy of fellowship with God once again. And we can enter into God's presence. We can be cleansed within and given the strength to stand against future temptations. We can know the power of God's Spirit in our lives again. And this will only happen when we genuinely confess and repent of our sins. Luke 15, 21 and 22. Luke 15, I'll close with this. And the son said unto him, this is the prodigal, Father, I've sinned against heaven, I don't like what David said here, and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said unto his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. Remember, they killed the fatted calf. The other son got jealous of his brother, wrongly so. You've sinned against God, as David said, upon thee and thee alone. In verse 4, I've done this evil in thy sight. Listen, sin's a terrible thing. It, it costs God becoming flesh, going to the cross. Why? Because he loved us so much. That's why. No other reason. We don't deserve that. David here in Psalm 51, maybe the greatest uh, so far that we've studied, uh, according to uh, me, <laughs> when it comes to confession, when it comes to restoration, when it comes to getting back to a right relationship. You know, a lot of times we think, well, we're saved, we've been forgiven. And we tell people, you're forgiven for past, present, and future sins. You're forgiven for the penalty. Salvation, again, we're not going to hell. That's the penalty. Uh, the second death separation from God. But what about the consequences for sin? <laughs> Practically, uh, there's, there's, a, there's a consequence in this life. Not going to hell, but the consequences of sin. David had consequences. He said the sword never left his house. He had problems with his own son. Uh, things were not the same. Was he still a man after God's own heart? Yes. Did God restore to him the joy of his salvation? Yes. But if he hadn't sinned, well, he did, and it's a great example for us, but if he hadn't, it would have been a lot different. I know people that uh, could have done things in the Christian life, but things they had done uh, kept them. People in the church uh, that desired to do things and caused uh, wreak havoc on their families, their wives, their spouses, their kids, and other families, and ruined their testimony and their relationship. Our pastors that I know, uh, we talk about it here, people, deacons, elders, I committed sin, and there was a consequence for it. There's this, this qualifications. They disqualified. It's terrible. It's a terrible thing. What we do, what the Bible says to do, we do it lovingly, but biblically. Can these people be restored? Though they never lost their salvation. A pastor will not be restored, I don't feel, to their position as a pastor because they disqualify. But can he serve the Lord again at some position? Yes, in the church. Not this position, but... There are other positions that don't have those qualifications. And so it's never a good thing. Never a good thing. And we're not trying to say just because David repented and he was restored, they're oh, just like it. In God's sight, just like it never happened. But what about... <laughs> Listen, if I had a problem with Terry here and had a problem in the church here, I, it ruins my testimony for the rest of my life. It's going to be there as that stand. God forgave me, yes. He said he forgets it like, you know, as far as the east is from the west. God does. He has a divine forgetter. We don't. And so the price is very high. You lose your position. You lose your testimony. You're shot. You know, you go out and talk to people about the Lord. You say, aren't you that pastor there that, that you know, we read about in the paper? <laughs> I'm like, well, yeah, but I was forgiven. Oh, yeah. Well, maybe God forgave you. But, and, and maybe they could too. But they, listen, it's very hard. Very hard. And much better if this had never happened to David. But it did happen. And this is a way for us to have a right relationship. We may never have a right relationship with other people because of what we did, but we can, we, and we want, we want that. But this is most important, amen? Because if this isn't right, this will never be right this way with others. But David did the right thing, 
He should not have kept it back for, what, over a year. But look, the man of God came to him, pointed his little <laughs> skinny little finger. Maybe it was a fat one, I don't know. But he, he told him the right thing. He spoke the truth to him. And David was like, <laughs> and he did the right, he had the right response. It should have never happened, but it did happen. The baby died. Things were never the same with his family and others down the line. You just, again, we don't have time tonight to go into it, but read about Absalom. <laughs> Most of the, some of the Psalms we had done earlier than this were about David's problems after he had repented and confessed everything was right again this way, but it was never the same. He, Absalom got half of the people of, of the nation of Israel, half that followed David, the other half that was following Absalom. It was terrible. His own son. And we believe it all stems from sin. And uh, David could go before God as he did and get confession, but his relationship with Absalom obviously was never right after that. And his own son rebelled against him. It's a sad thing. And uh, all we can do is get this relationship right and try as best we can with people. But I know some folks that would never... Good thing God's not like us. <laughs> There's some people that just won't forgive and they just hold it. And that, that's terrible, but again, I'm not God, but, and we're not God. And I'm glad that God's not like us, amen? When you're forgiven by God, you're forgiven. He purges us, he washes us because of what Jesus did on the cross. And uh, we pray. When, when, when this world is, is vanished and destroyed and Jesus is on the throne, that's when things will be perfect. But until then... We do the best we can, but the most important thing when we sin is against God. We make it right with him first, and then we try to take care of these other things. And some people, some people can't forgive. And the Bible says, Ephesians 4.32, Be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. Why? Even as, Christ, even as God for Christ's sake what, has forgiven you. I've been forgiven. Why can't I forgive others? Some people have a hard time with that. They take it personally to the point of, not forgiving, and it's wrong, especially for Christians. Let's pray. We're going to finish up, uh, not tonight. <laughs> we're going to have to finish this uh, either next Sunday if, if we have a Sunday service, uh, or but right in the very near future, maybe next year, 2022. Let's see. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word, and Lord, <laughs> I'd rather be uh, preaching on psalms of praise and the psalms clapping your hands that we did and all these joyous psalms of Israel climbing and walking up hill to the temple praising God and for your goodness and greatness and joy than to have to talk about these terrible things but this is something that's in your word or this is somewhat of a warning something that happened thousands of years ago that can affect us today and we're thankful for your word and it's very clear that in the seriousness and the consequences of sin but David at least again made it right and he made it right with you, forever affected him, forever changed the things in his life. I'm sure he would be the first one, if David were here tonight, to tell us not to do what he did in the first place. But Lord, his relationship with you was restored, and you did purge him, and you did wash him soul-wise as white as snow. And it's amazing that, Lord, the righteousness of Christ is imputed into us as sinners. When we Go to heaven, we're gonna, you're going to look at our account, and you're going to see Jesus' is perfect account, not ours, because ours is not perfect. Well, we're thankful we can have forgiveness, and we can have the righteousness of Christ imputed on our account. It's the only way we're going to heaven, by Jesus' record. So help us to understand these things. Help us, Lord, keep us, please, from sin. Help us to flee youthful lusts, Lord. Help us, please, to have victory in our lives. Uh, and uh, see how this affected David that we wouldn't want this to happen to any of us, Lord, or anyone that we care about and love. And so bless us. Give us a great night as we head to our homes, a good rest, a great week, preparing for the holidays coming up, Christmas on Saturday, Lord, New Year after that. Uh, bless uh, our folks, our church, our, our influence in this area, Lord, for the gospel. May you be glorified, Lord, more than anything, by our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.